Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, honorable uh, Senators, I rise uh, today to speak at second reading of Bill 377, an act to amend the Income Tax Act requirements for labor organizations, a bill that was first introduced in Parliament almost three years ago. Some opponents of this legislation have described it as anti-union, and I disagree. And I do that from the vantage point of uh, someone who has seen the best and the worst of unions. As a young man, I suffered serious injuries in an industrial accident and quickly came to appreciate the benefits of a union fighting on my behalf for a safer workplace. I went on to become the president of my local for the International Chemical Workers Union, my start in politics. I was proud to serve in that capacity and very early on uh, be part of groundbreaking initiatives to bring environmental protection issues to the bargaining table. There is no question I respect the achievements of unions in improving working conditions for men and women from across the country and for leading the way on so many issues Canadians care deeply about. But more recently, I have seen the other side of unions, and it is this recent experience that leads me to believe Bill C-377 is both reasonable and necessary. At the federal level, uh, this government has introduced extensive reforms to ensure Canadians have trust in their political institutions. The Accountability Act reformed the financing of political parties to reduce opportunities to influence politicians with contributions, banning union and corporate donations, and leveling the playing field among individual contributors. And spending by third parties, uh, thanks to the Cretchen government, is restricted to ensure they cannot unduly influence federal election campaigns. Unfortunately, uh, that is not the case in all other Canadian jurisdictions, particularly in my home province of Ontario. Starting in 2003, unions have channeled their resources, their members' dues, to electing Liberal governments in Ontario. In 2011, they spent more than $6 million on re-electing Dalton McGuinty. It's estimated that figure jumped to more than $10 million in the Ontario election this past June. In other words, these third parties, united toward a common goal, spent more than any of the three major parties is allowed to spend in elections in Canada's largest province. Now let's look at an example of their specific impact on the democratic process. In the fall of 2012, Ontario held two provincial by-elections. At stake was whether or not the Liberal government could slip over the threshold to a majority government. But Premier McGuinty had angered his union friends by introducing austerity measures aimed at curbing the province's bloated deficit, a deficit fueled for years by the Liberal government's decision to reward the unions with generous contracts. Union bosses united behind the NDP in Kitchener-Waterloo, the only competitive race. It resulted in the election of the first NDP member ever for that riding. And when financial statements were filed, it became clear how the NDP took Kitchener-Waterloo, despite spending just $50,000. Teachers' unions alone spent more than $1.5 million to elect the NDP. I want to repeat that. That's $1.5 million in just one riding. Make no mistake. Kathleen Wynne, when chosen to succeed McGuinty, got the message. The age of austerity was over. For the unions in Ontario, happy days were here again. And for long-suffering taxpayers, not so much. <laughs> the province's chief electoral officer has repeatedly called for limits on third-party advertising, a position endorsed even by the liberal-friendly Toronto Star. But I'm, uh, I'm not holding my breath on that one. 
It was no surprise that Ontario's Labour Minister opposed Bill 377 when it first came to the Senate, given that government's quid pro quo arrangements with big labour. Ontario is relatively unique in that there are absolutely no controls on third-party spending in election campaigns. But this example points out the need for some degree of transparency and disclosure of union finances. Right now, hundreds of millions of dollars of union dues, $860 million in 2012, are deducted from tax returns. That tax-exempt money is spent how the union bosses see fit. The members have little say over it, if they even know about it. Recently in Quebec, it was left up to the Charbonneau Commission to uncover union funds being spent in all sorts of non-bargaining ways, including construction of a strip club. Bill 377 imposes transparency and accountability on unions and nothing more. It would require labour organizations to file a public information return with the Canada Revenue Agency on an annual basis. The disclosure requirements would include financial statements, including a statement of assets and liabilities and a statement of income and expenditures, and other prescribed financial information, including amounts paid for, political and lobbying activities, and the salaries paid to executives and staff. In addition, the bill would require the CRA to display the information contained in the return in a searchable format on its website. And labour organizations that do not comply with the filing requirements would, upon conviction, be subject to a fine of up to $25,000. Disclosure will at least let members and the general public know how this tax-advantaged income is being spent. And Canadians want this disclosure, and they deserve it. An October 2013 Leger survey found that more than 80 percent of current or formerly unionized Canadians, and 83 percent of all working Canadians, want unions to publicly disclose their finances. The union bosses who oppose this bill so fiercely want to hide their spending, and not just from Canadians, but from their own members. And far from targeting unions, Bill 377 does no more than impose some of the same obligations that registered charities now face. Charities are required by law to operate exclusively for charitable purposes. There are strict rules regarding political activities. They are required to report complete and accurate information on an annual return that is publicly disclosed. And failure to comply can result in losing their charitable status. A contrast these obligations for disclosure and restrictions on activities for charities with the current anything goes treatment of union finances. Bill 377, in, in my view, is a modest initiative. It makes significant progress on the disclosure side, but it in no way restricts how unions can spend their money. And this is the essential point that has been missed or misconstrued by critics of the bill. Uh, particularly by those who claim Bill 377 is unconstitutional. No less an authority than former Supreme Court Justice Michel Bastarache uh, concluded that Bill 377 is constitutional because, and I quote, it merely provides for disclosure of financial information by labor organizations. It does not attempt to regulate the activities of such organizations or affect how their money is spent, end quote. No doubt we will hear from the critics that union finances are already disclosed to members. But if their finances are already open and transparent, then why are union bosses so afraid of Bill 377? They are against it because their claims of openness are bogus. Disclosure provisions are in place in only eight of Canada's 14 tax jurisdictions, and they are limited in their scope and vary from province to province. And not one province requires disclosure to the general public. The union bosses are against it because they don't want people, including their own members, to know how they spend their money. If they don't want to be accountable, they should give up their tax deduction. 
Bill 377 is a small step towards fairness, transparency, and accountability, a step that, in my view, is long overdue. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Speaker. Mon collègue ancien syndiqué prendrait quelques questions. Merci. Euh, ayant été sous-ministre adjoint à la main dœuvre au Québec, vous comprendrez que ce, ce sujet-là me, me touche particulièrement et euh, donc à ce moment-là soumis euh, aux lois provinciales avec rapport annuel et état financier publié et tous les euh, membres des syndicats ont accès à ces données et s'ils veulent avoir plus de renseignements, peuvent facilement euh, se prévaloir de demander euh, tous les rapports et, et d'avoir toute la transparence que mon collègue alors, je me demande comment mon collègue essaie de faire intervenir le gouvernement fédéral dans une juridiction qui est essentiellement provinciale. Well, I think I did, uh, Mr. Speaker, spell it out in my, uh, my comments. This is a, uh, a tax benefit uh, that all Canadians uh, uh, recognize as uh, coming from the federal government. Uh, and uh, I believe there's a responsibility on, on the part of, uh, of these institutions to, uh, to let us know how that money, that tax benefit that they are gaining uh, from federal legislation and from federal tax codes uh, is being utilized. And uh, I think that's a fair and uh, reasonable request. Je dois dire que je trouvais plutôt étrange tout votre détour pour nous parler des questions euh, euh, en, en vertu de, 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 de l'Ontario et des contributions qui auraient été faites. Euh, vous avez fait un grand détour dans cette question-là. Et je me posais la question, euh, puisque vous-même, vous avez euh, dit que c'était en Ontario que vous avez vu des choses qui ne vous plaisaient pas, euh, pourquoi votre intervention se fait ici, euh, au niveau du gouvernement fédéral alors que finalement, si ces choses-là euh, causaient des problèmes, c'est au gouvernement d'Ontario de légiférer. Et en ce qui me concerne, quand vous nous donnez comme subsidiaire la question d'avoir de, 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 des crédits d'impôt, on donne des crédits d'impôt euh, aux PME. À ce, ce moment-là, est-ce que les PME devraient publier aussi tous les états financiers et toutes les contributions? Et à partir de là... Si vous avez écouté la commission Charbonneau, vous savez, vous avez entendu parler de la, des prêtes non dans les entreprises, les bureaux de comptables, les bureaux d'ingénieurs. Demandez à M. Usakos, il est sûrement au courant. Alors, à ce moment-là, si à chaque fois qu'on reçoit un bénéfice, que ce soit pour un crédit d'impôt, pour une contribution politique ou un crédit d'impôt pour une entreprise, est-ce que tous les chiffres devraient être sur le, sur le site du ministère du Revenu? Well, Mr. Speaker, I've been asked to speak to uh, Bill C-377, and uh, what the member raises, uh, those suggestions may have merit, uh, but they're not the subject of this legislation, and uh, I support this legislation. Je regrette, Sénateur. J'ai pris tout simplement vos paroles en disant que la, la raison pour laquelle ça devenait de juridiction fédérale, c'est parce qu'il y avait un... Un, un, un aspect fiscal. Alors, je vous ai donné d'autres exemples en vous disant, si on veut être consistant dans les bénéfices fiscaux, de publier tous les états financiers de tous les, les joueurs sur la scène euh, dans le domaine économique, ce serait simple d'y de, 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 aller de, de l'avant. Mais à ce moment-là, euh, que faites-vous de la question, euh, fa, par exemple, de la Charte des droits qui qui dit aux gens, vous avez le droit de vous syndiquer, vous avez le droit de vous organiser, vous avez le droit de voter et à ce moment-là, euh, tout se fait en fonction des lois provinciales. Comment ça devient de, un domaine de, de juridiction fédérale par le biais du ministère du Revenu qui publierait plus de 1000 syndicats, toutes les données? Euh, dans, quel, dans quel but? Je ne, je ne sais pas si c'est pour aider les syndiqués ou pour euh, 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 informer la société canadienne. À mon avis, la société canadienne a déjà amplement à se renseigner sur les états financiers du gouvernement fédéral. Et j'aimerais savoir si, justement, ce, ce phénomène-là, que les syndiqués ne devraient pas être les, derniers, les premiers à, à, à se prononcer et les premiers à demander euh, quelques, 
modification que ce soit, mais pas au niveau fédéral, au niveau provincial. Senator Ronsiman. Oh, Mr. Speaker, public uh, financial disclosure for labor organizations uh, is, a, is a reality in most uh, G7 uh, countries, and many of the Canadian unions, which uh, have uh, American connections, already provide disclosure in the American jurisdiction. Uh, this is not something new, and in some respects, Canada is behind the times on this. So I, uh, again, I think this is uh, fair and reasonable. It's not a, an overly intrusive uh, uh, exercise with respect to uh, getting into the affairs of, of unions across this country. It's supported by a uh, vast majority of Canadians, according to the poll I cited, uh, including union members. And I know, uh, given my own experiences in Ontario, with the special assessments that uh, unions have made on, on their membership, a lot of members, rank and file members, disagree completely. But leadership has a different political motive in many instances and override the concerns of their own members. Here, here. Excusez-moi, Senator Savier-Pay. Senator Ransom, before I, I, you will need we, more time, if you ask for more time, then other questions can be asked. You're asking for more time? I'm not, but I, okay? I will agree to more time. <laughs> okay. So, we, we, cinq minutes, five minutes is, is given. Merci. Je voulais juste demander au, au sénateur quelles sont les juridictions euh, en dehors du Canada qui euh, donnent ce droit de publier tous les chiffres de toutes les centrales syndicales, que ce soit en Allemagne, euh, que ce soit en France, en Angleterre ou ailleurs. À ma connaissance, ce n'est pas une pratique euh, et surtout pas sur le site du ministère du Revenu de ces pays-là. Alors, j'aimerais avoir que vous nous fassiez parvenir, si, si, si vous ne l'avez pas tout de suite l'information, euh, l'information précise que le gouvernement canadien voudrait avoir. Not the sponsor of this legislation, but I uh, was advised that public financial disclosure uh, for, for uh, union and labor organizations is a reality in most G7 countries, and I will uh, ensure that uh, that information is uh, forwarded to your office. Senator Spurser. Would Senator Runciman take another question? Sure. Yes. Yes. Uh, I was struck by your repeated use of the phrase union bosses, um, which is a phrase one hears quite often from uh, certain segments of the debate on, on this issue. Union leaders are elected. And if their members don't vote them into office, then they're not union leaders anymore. Uh, in contrast, the managers with whom they negotiate are not elected. They do, it seems to me, qualify rather more for the phrase bosses, if one wants to go down that route. But I had been under the impression that people on the other side, and I hope I'm not uh, making too far a leap here, but that uh, you yourself on certain occasions had held that election confers legitimacy. So why go on calling people union bosses? Well, you can call them uh, corporate bosses, or you can call them labor bosses or union bosses. Uh, I don't, uh, if you wish to use that terminology, uh, feel free from my perspective. That's the way I like to describe many of these individuals who, uh, you know, you're right, they are elected and, uh, and uh, they have, I guess, the authority to uh, do and say what they please with respect to uh, the uh, matters that uh, fall under their uh, ambit of responsibility. But uh, um, I think it's an appropriate, uh, appropriate use of the English language and I will continue to use it, especially in respect to this uh, legislation. Senator Fraser. Well, I, I uh, will agree to disagree with my friend on this matter.